So um, I'll, I'll start straight into this. Um, the cancer mis misinformation landscape. Uh, and really when I was preparing these slides and given that I'd over a year to do it, I really was doing them over the weekend. Um, but where do I start um, with this? So I thought I'd break it into sort of three areas, the, the landscape. Uh, and I think unfortunately palliative care sees an awful lot of this, um, perhaps more acutely than, than many other aspects of medicine. The impact um, of that, particularly the impact on, on people, uh, and just some examples, some of the common things that I see as I uh, as I engage and interact and used to travel around. And that, it's also a good excuse for me to slip in a, uh, a holiday um, slide there from a year or two ago. So just to start out with a little bit of a definition, misinformation is, is really often described as a false or inaccurate information, uh, especially that which deliberately intends to deceive. So I suppose there's that intentional um, aspect of it. Unfortunately, we don't all necessarily recognize that intent to deceive. I think it's important to say at the outset that all of us have beliefs that are not actually backed by fact. So we are all, uh, and if we don't realize this, we can actually perhaps be even more vulnerable. We are all potentially um, involved in some element in, in, in terms of misinformation. We might have certain beliefs around certain things. We might do certain things, etc. And if we really delved further into them, we might find that maybe the evidence wasn't there or whatever. And sometimes we do things because that's the way we've always done them. That might be in healthcare, in, in medicine, etc. So I will um, outline that there are shades of grey um, where we believe and what we believe intermingles with, with facts. But I'm going to focus on the stuff which causes harm and the more overt um, aspects of that. So some general understandings, well, this is my observations of interacting both with family members impacted by ill health, as well as the wider public and, and talks that I give uh, around the country. Most people really don't understand the origins of cancer. They don't understand that it's multiple different diseases, multiple different causes, that everyone is born with a risk of, of cancer uh, and those kinds of concepts. They don't understand medical or scientific practice uh, and indeed, there's a growing gulf as medicine becomes increasingly sophisticated, as outlined by several of the, the uh, speakers earlier, as it becomes increasingly sophisticated, it becomes more distant from people's actual understanding. Most people, unfortunately, though, do think things are better abroad. There's often an anti-Irish bias, I find, in, in, in stuff. And, and, you know, claiming something comes from abroad is often a great way to sell it. People, unfortunately, sometimes expect easy treatment of a health condition. If I do this, if I become vegan, you know, whatever it might be, that will fix my issue. Um, they fear, and, and fear is a lot of a, the challenge that undermines um, different aspects, particularly, I think, as we get older. Fear of a loss of control, fear of pain, fear of disease, fear of cancer, and fear of death. And I, I kind of rank them maybe in an order in, in, in which I've seen it anyway, that, that it's some of the things that really occupy people's minds. And the challenge is those come together and they can make people vulnerable both intellectually. So in, by intellectually, I mean, perhaps they don't use the same intellectual analytical tools that they might apply to any other aspect of their life. They might be professionals or whatever, but also um, intell intellectually, emotionally. This emotional vulnerability, um, just to go into that in, in a bit of a deeper dive, and I think there's a lot of contributors to this, and I, I do feel a little bit like I'm, I'm teaching a granny to suck eggs here because I think there are much more experienced people um, to talk to these areas. So at a kind of a very cursory level, I think we might all agree that life is increasingly complex for many of us, um, and that in itself is, is a challenge. So there's so much information. COVID has been a very good example that we have the daily bingo of COVID numbers, we have all of the various different um, aspects that kind of come in from information, the news, our social media feeds, etc. So life is complex. And as human beings, we often tend to weigh that information in, in a manner that has served us well up to date, but, but maybe now is more open to manipulation. So we tend to believe things more on the basis of volume. So if 10 people or 100 people tell us this, or we get 100 feeds or 100 likes or whatever, we tend to think that that's more accurate than one person. We tend to trust people and tend to listen to the people that we trust uh, much more than uh, the people that we don't trust. And that can end up with, I suppose, different types of, of bubbles, um, to, to use a COVID expression, where we end up in, a, I suppose, a, a bipartisan type scenario where the people in our bubble are right about everything and the people outside of our bubble are inaccurate or wrong about everything. And, and that can become a, an ever decreasing circle. 
We also tend to listen to people who are like us, same color, same creed, same age, whatever it might be. And, and belief is a significant challenge in, in misinformation because um, we often tend to believe the things that resonate with our own beliefs. And many people are very spiritual, even in the modern high tech age, many people still fall back on their spirituality and their belief systems rather than evidence based or, or, or analytical type approaches. And finally, trust. Trust is, I think, critically important in these days as well. Who do we actually trust to give us their information? And, and I suppose, again, some of the things that I might have observed, and it varies by person, but I think people tend to trust more their family and their friends. And increasingly now, people who are famous, celebrity or influencers, people who are um, we bring into that little bubble of ours through maybe social media. Unfortunately, the trust ranking of professionals for some is certainly declining. And then there are other um, folks, our, 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 um, our policy leaders, our politicians, etc. And, and that's a little bit of a change, I think, over time to where we may have been when, certainly when I was younger, uh, where professionals and, and so on were regarded as, as much more absolute authorities. Our social circle and, and particularly social media uh, within that social circle can be important. And when someone we know gets sick, so if a neighbor or a friend, and I often get questions, particularly as my guess around the, the cancer situation, um, if someone gets sick, um, often we want to do something. We want to try and help. It's, a, it's an inherent part of, of human nature. But unfortunately, sometimes we can seek really um, quite trivial routes to, to, to try and do that. Things that maybe placate ourselves more um, than assist the person. One example being somebody might come to me and I would say, right, well, I'll go online and I'll look up a, a book and I'll get that person a self-help book. Um, and we can see this, uh, maybe we bring in information that we've seen on television, on some lifestyle show, on Facebook, guides, various different things. But just for example, on the Amazon thing, if I put in cancer cure, which is a very common thing that might I might want uh, if I hear of somebody with that, all of the first page of things are complete and utter nonsense. And, and that's a challenge because I might know this, I might pass it on to that person, and then I'm a valued opinion for that person, and they are more likely to absorb whatever it is I've given them. We're also seeing uh, an increase in democratization of health information, and that's a little bit of a Pandora's box. I wouldn't be as negative about that, um, at, at perhaps, as others. But, you know, we hear about Dr. Google, um, every one of us, if we get something or if we get a medicine, we tend to go off uh, and we tend to, to Google that. And some of us, I suppose, are better trained to make use of that, and some people not so. Um, and part of the challenge can be, it can be very easy to feel that one is becoming a researcher with all of this access. And, you know, for example, pretty much every published uh, and authored piece of scientific information is readily accessible now, sometimes behind paywalls, but often we can certainly access at least the abstract of this information. And the challenge is against the tools and training that we develop as researchers over years, if not decades, we can be misled by the presence of research rather than the context of that research. And a good example is this compound resveratrol. Um, and resveratrol on paper looks like a, a fantastic uh, adjunct to, to cancer treatment. It, it comes from um, red grapes and, and certain other fruits. But the reality is it's pretty much nonsense because we can never achieve the concentrations of resveratrol in our bodies that have anything close to the levels required um, to have a therapeutic effect. And that basic knowledge may be very absent because we haven't been trained in how to assess and understand that. Psychologists talk about this concept of the Dunning-Kruger um, uh, effect. And I think we all see that today as well. And again, we can all sometimes fall back on this. And I think if you see certain Twitter and social media discussions around aspects of things like public health, et cetera, everybody has become an epidemiologist, for example, over the last year. And epidemiology is a very, very tough science. So I think in any aspect of, of uh, intellectual development, I think we see that um, uh, it's, it's, it's easy to be misled into believing that we know a lot about it just because we can access some information. And it's only with experience and training that we can learn how little that we know. And maybe hopefully as our journey continues and as we evolve, we, we, we begin to actually become more expert in something. 
the modern communications environment is certainly a challenge um, as well. There's no question now, and I think if you if you maybe delve into your own thoughts and in the own your own things that you read, what you're watching on the television, what you're following on your social media feeds, and maybe this audience is a little bit different, but in, I think in the general sort of public thing, there's a massive growth in discussion of health. It's a massive element and massive topic in communications, in media, and there's a, a very significant amount of money uh, around this. So you know we've got um, personalities on television and um, Dr. Oz. We have Instagram posters with their juices or, or, or whatever um, perspective they, they're trying, I suppose, to, to have people interested in them. And we see different aspects coming up. So we see discussion around diets. A lot of the lifestyle television programs will tell us we should be eating this, should be eating that, uh, et cetera. Different supplements, herbs, et cetera. CBD uh, comes up a lot, not so much on mainstream media, but certainly on social media. Uh, there's a massive amount around that. And certainly I find when I talk factually around that, I get massive amounts of, of negative interactions um, and, and challenging interactions from people. Body image, lifestyle, people talking about medicines, uh, what they should or shouldn't be taking, et cetera. Um, tests, whether you know people should be having tests for this or, or, or tests for that. Again, there's a whole industry pushing certain types of, of tests. And this concept of toxins, detoxifying our environment, et cetera. Hopefully that's resonating with some of your own experiences. But most of this is commercially driven and it's often subtly commercially driven. So I, I suppose we, we, we have the understanding of seeing an advert between our television programs and we know that that's commercially driven to try and attract us to that product. But that's exactly what's happening in a lot of our Instagram posts or a lot of the YouTube and a lot of the other kind of things. It's just not so um, overt, it's not so clear to us. Uh, and the media needs this health, health communication. So there's a, a symbiotic relationship between types of media, social media, etc. So um, they need to fill content, they need viewers, ad revenue, etc. Uh, and, and ultimately, it's paying for that activity. I don't think people realize just how vast an industry that is. So, so if we take a number of these different elements together, the, the sector has been valued at 4.5 trillion. So 4.5 thousand billion US dollars in 2018. Not all of that is necessarily um, negative, but just to give you a concept of that, and even if we look at one element and um, the keto diet, the products alone for that um, diet area are worth over 10 billion US dollars. So that's not including services, um, books, and all of those other kinds of things. We see a lot of different real world examples, um, you know, for example, foodstuffs where they're claimed to boost the immune system or, um, you know, otherwise make us um, in some way superhuman or superior. And this is one I came across and um, that was going around a number of Irish supermarkets. Mangoes are nice, don't get me wrong. I like a good mango, um, but it does not um, boost my brain health. Um, and, and I suppose these things are becoming so commonplace now that we just absorb them. We see a lot of detail now in aspects like Netflix. I mean, you can spend whole days going through the various shockumentaries uh, on Netflix, and some of those can be incredibly harmful. And this individual will be well known to you and recently uh, faced a very significant fine uh, in Australia for some of his activities. But yet he still gets a very large following and people believe you know, what he says. This one maybe you mightn't have seen, and uh, I never thought when I was a student or even younger that I would be featuring somebody wearing a plastic bag over their face. But Blind by Boat Club did this fantastic um, uh, analysis, and, and they, they set up these influencers uh, with this concept of cyan cyanora. So cyanora was basically a drink. It's not real, thankfully, but it contained cyanide. And um, these folks went off and they started promoting it for financial um, kind of gain. They had no background on it. And these people collectively had many millions of followers behind them. Some of you may have also heard about Bell Gibson. And again, um, this is a case of someone who made many, many false ca uh, claims, but was amplified by involvement with Penguin and, and with Apple. And we've seen it in, in Ireland as well. And I suppose part of the challenge is there's no statutory regulatory um, aspect um, so these two individuals would be an example where they were making completely false claims about a, a, a diet. I, I believe they were even given some oxygen uh, some time ago in the, in the palliative space as well. Um, and really the only uh, recourse that people had, and I was involved in, the, in this particular case, was to make a, a report to the Advertising Standards Authority, which is an industry body. It has no statutory function. There's very little regulation, I suppose, in the professional sense. It can be very difficult to rein in um, certain doctors and, and, and uh, nurses and that, and particularly if they go outside of their main kind of clinical practice. 
and there's very little um, regulation, certainly statutory regulation of media uh, uh, and particularly the internet. Newspapers may be more so, but certainly the internet uh, and things around the internet. And I think, again, we're seeing that challenge and recognizing it with the acute problems we're facing this information um, with COVID. There's also a problem of volume, that just the sheer amount of this is actually practically very difficult to regulate. And I think the social media companies are finding that. So moving on then in terms of the impact, um, I, I work a lot with patients and, and this great lady, Eileen O'Sullivan, um, gives a fantastic talk about the impact of misinformation. And she described, and I've just captured some of the headlines of her own cancer diagnosis and the emotional aspect, the burden um, that it brings. And again, I think this audience will be particularly um, sensitive to many of these things, but most of these are negative emotions and emotions that bring on vulnerability, fear, anxiety, denial, the very primitive emotions um, and the, hence things that can reinforce and support those um, can be very important to the person. So all of these can obviously increase the, the vulnerability that somebody might have. Um, we see targeting and, for example, uh, you may or may not have seen a couple of years ago um, a programme that we were involved in by, by RT Primetime called Desperate Decisions. And it outlined the targeting that's used um, by international um, clinics for Irish patients, promising them and giving them false hope of miracle cures, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and the reality is very stark. And these clinics can be found in places like Turkey, Germany, Mexico and the US. And that's not to say that all of medicine in those countries is undermined. It certainly isn't. Um, but just one example that we, we showcased in that program where one woman was left at an airport to die after um, her inverted commas treatment in the Turkish clinic. And I, I think it's important that people understand and, and Irish people have this sense, unfortunately, of a lot of stuff going on internationally and, and you know, better than internationally. Um, and, and I think there's a challenge there that we sometimes have to work against. Some examples of this, um, we, you know, there's um, examples from the medical sense of doctors who are um, trying to use facts against things like essential oils. Um, this is an example, the, the middle gentleman there um, had um, essentially overdosed on um, green tea um, extract uh, and it had destroyed his liver. So his colour is not false there. He has um, John, this yellow colour due to um, very acute and severe uh, liver damage and uh, needed a liver transplant. Uh, and this um, poor unfortunate young woman was taken in by Robert Young, the proponent of the alkaline diet, and she died uh, ultimately having taken baking soda as a treatment for her um, cancer. It's not just abroad though, um, and uh, I work a lot with dietitians. And uh, for example, this is a an illustration of the um, supplements that one patient was taking um, who was being uh, under the care of um, a, a, a dietitian uh, in, in, in Ireland. And I, I don't think this is particularly unusual. Uh, and also I think much of that can be hidden. So sometimes people don't, at least this person was, was explaining to the dietitian what they were taking. And these things have real world um, implications. So again, this is another example from uh, another dietitian, and I'm grateful to Una Griffin for this detail. This is a woman who presented with a curable early stage pancreatic cancer. Um, but for, for reasons um, that I've, I suppose I've kind of outlined, she opted for out of, out of the kind of surgical um, treatment and probably curative treatment of that towards um, dietary changes and, and, and so on. Ultimately, her malignancy progressed she lost initially a quarter and then close to a third of her body weight. Uh, and that impacted her ability to be treatment, to be treated with chemotherapy. And she passed away. And I suppose the point that I'm trying to imply from this is that perhaps that person might still be around um, today were it not for that. So these are very real world um, implications. So to finish up, just some examples, I suppose, of things that I come across and, and I suppose try and um, speak up, uh, out again. So I've um, kind of broken them into uh, four um, major groups. Uh, and these are misinformation things that I come across pertaining to cancer. So uh, often people think that cancer is a new disease and it's caused specifically by chemicals, environment, pesticides, not eating organic fluoride in the water. That's a really common one, unfortunately. Mobile phones, an increasingly common one, technology, uh, genetically modified organisms, whatever the, the, the flavor of the day might be. And in point of fact, none of these are true. Um, and I suppose I would counter these things by the fact that mankind has always had cancer. Um, we know this 
archaeologists have found um, mummies, etc., with cancer. And while not perfect, our basic food and environment really has never been safer or healthier. Um, and part of the challenge is we're living longer. In about 120 years, our life expectancy has essentially almost doubled. Life expectancy around the turn of the 18th into the 19th century um, was around about 40 to 45. Life expectancy now for most people is over 80. So we're living longer, chronic diseases are, are, are more likely, but I don't think we understand that we're more likely to see those then, and especially you know, as we get older. Um, and we live in a media environment dominated by fear and focusing on the negative. So focusing on very small little reports that may be presented out of context. And much of that um, media is financed by click advertising. So if I go into an article now, um, that record of me going in drives advertising revenue for whatever was on that page that I also saw. And I think people often misunderstand research as well and the weighting of research. We all know that there is a constant stream of research that is maybe um, not as, as well evidence-based or is about a very specific thing. So it can be easy to misunderstand that. People believe that there's a magic bullet, potion, food or medicine that will prevent all cancers, cure all cancers, whatever. So if I just take this, I won't get cancer. If I have this diet, etc., I won't get cancer. Or if I have cancer, I won't need um, uh, treatment. And again, unfortunately, this is not the case. As we know, and um, cancers are many different types of disease. It's not a single disease. So we're never ever going to have really a single um, treatment um, or a single kind of approach, either from the prevention or from the treatment angle. And the reality is that cancer cells are almost, absolutely almost identical to normal cells. So identifying some form of therapy that is unique to the cancer is actually very challenging because different um, cancers will respond to different agents, different cells will respond and research is obviously ongoing, but bearing in mind that a lot of preliminary research never actually makes it even the clinical trial and this very high attrition rate across the clinical trial um, treatment uh, development scheme for, for, for cancer agents. So cannabis uh, and, and related agents, CBD, turmeric, curcumin, et cetera, all of these are touted as cure-alls. They've all been tested, and, and I suppose I, I outlined some of the larger reviews on, on certainly on the cannabinoids. Um, and yet we do have lots of effective medicines emerging that are creating other kinds of challenges in, in cancer. Uh, the third myth is this concept of superfoods. And I suppose anytime I hear that term, I immediately have my, uh, my, my uh, defenses up. So superfoods preventing or, or curing cancer. And in reality, there's no such thing as a superfood. And we know for the general population, a varied mixed diet, rich in vegetables, et cetera, is associated with the lowest um, overall level of ill health or the, the highest level of good health. Um, and, and you know, a lot of these supplements, um, many people really don't need to take them. And indeed they can be harmful. We have evidence of uh, interference from vitamin supplementation in, in cancer treatment and in, in cancer outcome. And the final of these myths is that certain diets can prevent, treat, or, or cure cancer. Again, I think an incredibly um, common uh, misbelief and, and one that is really very much touted out there. And I suppose we know that there's no diet, no single diet focusing on uh, a single nutrient, either taking just that nutrient or excluding a single nutrient, like for example, sugar has been shown to be beneficial in cancer. And sugar is always um, touted as this you know, really dark negative thing uh, and that, which it, which it isn't. It's part of our normal homeostatic body chemistry. So diets like the keto, alkaline juicing, vitamin supplements, etc., all of these are untrue. And I suppose the extra challenges that people in advanced ill health or with cancer often have complex additional kind of needs. So to conclude, and I'm going to leave a little bit of homework for folks, there's certainly things that you can check up. Um, uh, no such thing as a, as a free talk. Um, uh, there is a lot of information out there. Um, I suppose people have a lot of different beliefs and beliefs are complicated. I think we need to recognize that it's a vast industry um, and the exploitation is often quite, quite subtle in that. People with ill health and particularly um, diseases that in, can engender fear like cancer can be particularly vulnerable. And sometimes the people around them, while very well-meaning, can actually, their intentions can, can lead to, to challenges as well. And I suppose I would live by the mantra that if it sounds too good to be true, it often is. So to, to, to finish up then, just as I say, so some homework and really more some, some resources. I suppose various people, particularly on social media, have developed some handy tools around 
things to keep an eye out for and things to avoid and and and, uh, and, and just to be alert and, and, and attentive to. So people using anecdotes or testimonials rather than actual evidence, conspiracy, uh, et cetera. I won't go through all of these in the interest of time. Um, uh, people who talk about, you know, quantums or toxins or, you know, energy and, and, and people who talk about Western medicine, because as, as the cartoon says there, there is only medicine. There is no Eastern or, or Western medicine. Medicine is a stuff that's evidence based. And I, I finish with one that I found um, very useful, which is the CRAP test. And I think the acronym will maybe help stick in people's minds. And it was developed um, by, by Dr. Skylar Johnson, who's given us a, a quite a bit of consulting in the, in the Cancer Society. And it's a, a, a very simple matrix to assess any new um, any new input. So, um, is the is the new concept? Is it making a, a claim? Is it based on a conspiracy? Um, is it too good to be true? As I, I, I touched on already, are the people looking for money? You know, buy my book, buy my uh, seminar series, and these seminar series can be quite lucrative. In the keto situation, one of the people involved was charging over a thousand euro for a three month virtual consult. Um, with, with no medical or other qualifications. Does it involve an anecdote as a story? So in other words, um, Mr. Jones took this extract and never got cancer, you know, type thing. And also the publisher, you know, where is it coming from? Is it, is it something when you do a little bit of uh, background investigation, you, uh, you know, you find um, that, re that really it's not uh, either from a professional body or whatever. So I'm going to finish up there and leave that on. Uh, maybe invite Michael back on uh, if, uh, if, he, if he wants to, if, uh, if we have questions. I've been following the slides and trying to keep the time more than, than that. So 